Chapter 1. Prospecting. Finding new potential clients that have a need for your solution is one of the most challenging tasks faced by any salesperson, entrepreneur, or small business owner. Prospecting is the first fundamental stage in the sales process. The effectiveness of your prospecting efforts will have a direct impact on your sales results and on your success or failure in the profession of selling. Poor prospecting is by far the number one reason startup businesses and sales rookies fail every single day. It's also the number one reason why salespeople lose motivation and leave the sales profession altogether. There are many methods of prospecting for new clients, but you need to discover which one is the most effective in your line of business. One of the first and foremost decisions you will need to make is whether you need to take the quality or quantity approach. As a rule of common sense, the lower the value of your solution, the higher the volume of leads you're going to need in order to generate enough sales. Many companies use a combination of marketing and sales to generate leads these days. Activities include emails, cold calling, trade shows, advertising, and even good old fashioned door to door canvassing. The newest method of outbound prospecting is known as inbound marketing. Now this trend typically relates to the generation of leads by using blog posts and other types of content as a sort of bait. Many foolish marketers claim that inbound marketing has removed the need for salespeople. I'm not entirely sure what they think happens to the inbound leads if there's nobody to call them, but maybe they'll close themselves. I don't know. Inbound marketing does an excellent job of grabbing the attention of a prospect. It makes a salesperson's job easier because it breaks down the first wall of resistance, but the selling still needs to be done, so don't forget that. For me, inbound marketing is pretty much just the same as advertising on a billboard or a website. A piece of content just replaces the advert. I like the idea, but so far in my experience, the inbound leads created by this method are often much weaker than those you can generate by cold calling or using other methods. You'll be far more successful in sales if you can master the art of prospecting using a variety of different approaches. I always warn my clients that relying solely on any single method is nothing short of business suicide. You may have already found ways of generating leads, maybe via your website, word of referral, or by attending trade shows. Now, making contact with these leads is often referred to as warm prospecting. But, as you'll discover from experience, this does not necessarily mean these leads are of a higher quality than the ones you could generate from cold prospecting. With recent advancements in technology and the internet, many businesses have found more efficient methods of prospecting, which has reduced the need for cold calling. But this does not necessarily mean cold calling is dead. My question for any existing business that generates warm leads from excellent modern tools is to consider what would happen tomorrow if that method of prospecting were no longer available or doubled in cost. How then would you prospect for new business? You should always be skilled in two if not three methods of prospecting. The business world and your potential clients are constantly changing. So you must be prepared to adapt if you want continued success. So rather than maintaining a strong belief that inbound prospecting has killed the cold call or vice versa, use your energy to put together a killer strategy. Design one that mixes the vast variety of prospecting tools you have at your disposal so you're one step ahead of the future and better equipped than your competitors. Vertical prospecting. Before you even consider picking up the phone or buying any lead lists, you need to sit down and construct a picture of who your ideal clients might be. You don't need to generate an accurate picture, you just need a batch of ideas to get you started. This pre-prospecting research will not only save you endless wasted hours, but it will also help you avoid quickly killing the team morale and motivation. Individual prospect demographics can range from simple ones such as gender and age to more business to business related demographics like departments or job titles of contacts, industry types or number of employees in a company, etc. 
By running through simple demographics and eliminating the ones that are irrelevant, you should end up with a smaller set you can work with. And this is where vertical prospecting comes in. Vertical prospecting is a method of running targeted campaigns on a particular industry or demographic set. If you're launching a new product or service, this is one of the most efficient ways of discovering your ideal target audience quickly. Let's say you started a business offering debt collection services. There are millions of potential businesses around the world who could benefit from your services. But if you only have a small sales team, it's not going to be possible to get in touch with all of them. In today's business world, you cannot afford to play the trial and error game. So here's what you do. First, get your team together and share thoughts and ideas about what potential prospect demographics you think have a need for your services. Depending on the size of your sales team, you should aim to put together two or more different verticals, such as one, businesses with under 10 employees in the IT industry. Two, businesses with 15 to 25 employees in the IT industry. And three, businesses with under 10 employees in the design industry. Once you've selected your verticals, you'll need to get a hold of the data. Now, there are lots of free and paid sources available where you can find customized lead data based on certain demographics. Just know that whichever supplier you choose, always be sure to request a sample of the data to make sure it's not out of date. You should also check how many duplicates are in the list because I've noticed, for example, that there can be a lot of contacts from the same company in one list. Once you've got the data, it's time to start prospecting. Depending on the estimated length of your sales cycle, you can test different vertical campaigns against each other on a daily or weekly basis. You could spend one day or one week prospecting on vertical A and the next day or week prospecting on vertical B and so on. This strategy enables you to quickly see which verticals perform best and which ones don't. With a bit of luck, you may get success across multiple verticals. Keep digging into the data and tracking everything though, because your best verticals are not always the ones that convert into the most leads or sales, but the ones that result in the most revenue. There's so many different vertical campaigns you can try, and sometimes it can take years before you actually finally discover your perfect prospect demographics. The key in the beginning is not to find the perfect one. You should aim to find one or more that work for you and start growing your revenue. Vertical prospecting is also a brilliant method of keeping you motivated in sales. It allows you to master your tailored pitch by using it on every single call, while at the same time offering a motivating variation when testing different verticals. I don't believe the days of cold calling or email blasting from yellow pages or other generic non-targeted lead lists are dead, but they're limited. These methods are often only profitable for large businesses selling to the consumer masses or those selling high value products or services where one sale may equal an entire month's target. Some of the most successful prospecting campaigns I've been involved with or have seen work in the past have been the ones that were put together using vertical prospecting. No matter who you are or what you sell, identifying your ideal clients is crucial for your future growth. How to warm up your cold calls. It pains me to hear the words, can I speak to the person in charge of the marketing department or anything similar coming from the mouth of a salesperson when cold calling. It tells me that either the person is lazy, untrained or working for a company that doesn't provide them with the right sales tools for the job. When you call and ask for the name of the person you want to speak to, it makes you an easy target for gatekeepers who will screen your calls. Even if you ask politely for an email address, you'll most likely end up with the one beginning with info at that results in a failed contact attempt and a waste of your time. The good news is that this method of phishing for prospect information is becoming obsolete. Today's search and social crazy internet world have made warming up your cold calls a whole lot easier. My favorite tools for finding relevant and up-to-date contact information about warm or cold prospects are online search engines and LinkedIn. 
If you can master a few basic tips and tricks for using them, you'll be able to find valuable information about every single one of your prospects in a matter of seconds and totally free of charge. For example, let's say you wanted to reach a marketing manager at a specific company. Simply navigate to a search engine and type the following, the company name followed by the words marketing manager. By enclosing the search phrase within double quotation marks, you will search explicitly for search results where these words appear together on the same page. If you're unable to find any useful results, I recommend you play around with the search terms a little. For example, you could search for the word director instead of manager. The top result from these searches will often include links to LinkedIn profiles where the selected words appear in what is called a meta description. This is a snippet of text from the web page indexed by the search engine. Now, before you start jotting down all of the contact names, consider these two things first. One, the pages indexed by search engines are not updated every day and could take a few weeks to update in some circumstances. And two, the meta description taken from LinkedIn profile can show both past and present jobs. This means your next step is to confirm whether any of these people still work at the company. For speed, I always right click each link and open each one in a new tab to quickly review all of the profiles and close down the unnecessary ones. Each profile usually provides you with a wealth of useful contact information. Even if one of your contacts are no longer at the company you search for, it's likely they moved on to a similar role at another company, making them another potential prospect and a perfect addition to your prospecting list. So through some straightforward generic online searches, you can discover the names, job roles and multiple other contacts to ask for when you start making calls, which will heavily increase your chances of reaching them. It's important to know that unless you have a decent number of contacts on LinkedIn, you may not be able to view all of the information on some profiles. The only current way to do this is by upgrading to a premium account or by growing your network. I recommend spending one to two minutes maximum using the same process to locate direct numbers, email addresses, and other relevant data before you start making calls. If it takes longer, pick up the phone and ask for the information. Don't fall into the trap of spending half your days searching online for contact data. It will cost you time, money, and maybe your job. But let's say you're dealing with a tough secretary who won't give you the information you need. Or maybe you're working on a vertical where you have more time to conduct pre-prospecting research. If you want to locate a direct email address for someone, there's a stack of online tools available for this. I'm not going to name any, any of them because, well, they'll probably be out of date by the time I'm finished writing this book. So let's stick with using a search engine. The first thing you want to figure out is the format used in the email address of the company where your contact works. Now, most of the time, it's just the same as the website address, but with some larger businesses, it can be different. So keep your eye out for that. In the case of my company, for example, you can simply go to my website and guess my email address will end with the address at davidcraigwhite.com, which is exactly what you need. You now need to copy and paste at davidcraigwhite.com into the search engine using quotation marks to ensure accurate results. And this should pull up any other email addresses indexed on the search engine containing this text. What you're looking for is another email address for anyone else in the same company, because this will give you the structure for everyone else's email, including your contact. For example, it could just be the first name only, such as david at davidcraigwhite.com or it could be the first initial and last name like D white at davidcraigwhite.com. There's an enormous amount of information and prospecting tools available at your fingertips these days. So there's only a small number of acceptable excuses left to be calling without a contact name. So take some time out to do a little research into what other tips, tricks, and tools are out there because it can save you a lot of personal time and frustration. How to handle rejection in sales. When you work in the profession of selling, you must become immune to the word no. 
Sometimes new salespeople enter the profession without any advice or expectations about how much they'll have to handle rejection in sales, let alone how to deal with that rejection. If you don't have a strategy for handling rejection in sales, you are destined to suffer. Selling can often be about 99% rejection and 1% acceptance. Now, maybe that doesn't apply to all sales positions, but I've certainly worked at places where it has. There's two core ingredients to the secret sauce of dealing with rejection. Number one is having an awareness of the rejection. And number two is learning how not to take rejection personally. If you take rejection personally, you'll never succeed in this profession and will likely spend your days either upset, depressed or infuriated. Sales is a numbers game. That is a fact. Some businesses believe in driving in as many leads as possible and closing at a close ratio, whereas others prefer to go for a quality over quantity approach. But regardless of which approach your company takes, you'll always be dealing with more no's than yeses. My former boss Raj Singh once told me, you should treat every no that you receive as being one no closer to getting to your next yes. I was an inexperienced sales rookie at the time, making over 100 cold calls a day in the business-to-business -business telecommunications industry. So hearing the word no became familiar fast. In that job, we had a rule. For every 100 prospects we contacted, we would make at least one sale. Those were the numbers, and that was how I became immune to the word no and stopped taking it so personally. I saw every rejection as positive because it was one more no I could cross off my list, which increased the chances I would get a yes on my next call. So if you're a salesperson, ask your manager for the average number of calls it takes to make a sale or book a meeting where you work. If you're a sales manager, you should ensure you have the answer. Like many things in life, dealing with rejection is much easier if you set expectations from the get-go. If you communicate and set expectations accurately, things work much better. If people know what to expect, they won't get frustrated as easily or lose motivation. Knowing how many calls or meetings it takes to close a sale not only sets expectations, it also helps you quickly evaluate whether you're doing things well or not. If it takes an average of 100 calls to make a sale at your company and it takes you 300 calls, it's easy to isolate the problem and ask for help. Naturally, if you're new to the company or new to the profession of selling, you won't instantly start closing at the same rate as everyone else. But your manager should be able to give you a good indication of their expectations so you can work on them. Another great way of dealing with rejection is to do your calculations based on a financial figure. For example, if you know that each sale you make is worth a thousand pounds, and you know how many calls it takes to make a sale, then calculate how much each call is worth to you. If every sale you make is worth a thousand pounds and it takes you on average 50 calls to make a sale, then each call you make is worth 20 pounds, regardless of whether you get a yes, a no, or a maybe. Treating rejection as a challenge is also another great strategy used by the best. It keeps you motivated and builds an inner strength that will serve you well as a salesperson and as a human being in everyday life. How to develop self-confidence. One of the most important skills you must have when working in the profession of selling is self-confidence. You must first and foremost believe in yourself and you must also believe in the products or services that you are selling. You must. If you lack self-confidence, it won't matter if you're selling the best or the worst products or services in the world. Your results will be average at best. Some people think it's not possible to develop self-confidence and claim it to be some sort of genetic thing. But let me assure you that nobody on this planet came out of their mother's womb, looked around and said, Hey people, what's up? You become self-confident when you become good at something. Let me say that again, because I want you to write it down and remember it, because it's important. You become self-confident when you become good at something. And to get good at something, you have to do it over and over and over. Repetition equals mastery. 
Mastering any skill, whether it's taking free kicks, cooking eggs, or cold calling, is only ever achieved when you keep practicing. If you want to master sales, you need to put in the activity levels required. Now, making 30 calls a day might get you to mastery in 20 years, but it will do nothing for your confidence in the short term. Making 100 or 200 calls per day will get you to mastery and build your self-confidence much faster. Now, I'm not one of these productivity freaks who will keep preaching at you to make more calls, make more calls, far from it. I strongly believe in taking timeouts to review your performance by recording and listening to your calls so you can isolate and correct your mistakes. But that being said, if you're not putting in the right amount of activity in the beginning, you're either never going to improve or it's going to take you a long time. Now, apart from repetition, knowledge about your product is also a powerful self-confidence booster. Product knowledge gives you the belief that you can answer your prospects' questions and overcome any potential objections they might have. The only warning I will give you about becoming a product expert is to make sure it does not come at the cost of you being a sales expert. Product knowledge without sales skills will again guarantee average results. Now, I've already touched on this a little before, but experience is also a confidence booster. And my version of experience is not how long you've been doing something, it's how much effort you've put into doing it. You can gain just as much experience in one year as someone else gains in 10. I've met plenty of sales veterans who have worked in sales for far more than a decade and are not half as skilled as some of the rookies who've been in sales for little over a year. So don't let anyone ever tell you that you don't have enough experience for any job. Just tell them experience is not about how long you've worked, it's about how hard you've worked. And I'm pretty sure they'll like your confidence. I also want to give you another strategy for building self-confidence, which is a little different, but it works if you're open-minded. It's an approach where you take the confidence you felt in one experience and transfer it to another. So think about a time in your life where you felt super confident about something. Maybe it's a skill you have now, or maybe it's something you were really good at when you were younger. Now close your eyes for a few seconds and recall that memory. Thinking about where you were, what you were doing, what smells were in the air, what you could see, what you could hear. Really take yourself back into that zone just for a second. Next, I want you to focus on your physiology in that moment of supreme confidence. How were you standing? What were the thoughts running through your mind? How were you breathing? What words were you telling yourself? If this exercise went as planned, you have now put yourself in a physical and mental state of confidence. And it's this memory and condition you should focus on before you pick up the phone in times of self-doubt. Just take a few moments to focus on that feeling and bring it into your calls. When you already have some confidence and when you're doing well, you sometimes need an extra kick to keep you going. And there's nothing better than kicking someone else's backside. Now, of course, I'm not talking about physically abusing your colleagues, but I am talking about competing with them. If you're a salesperson, then I hope your manager is already setting up internal competitions for you. If not, don't worry, because you can create your own competitive environment. Take a look at the person next to you, or maybe even the one who sits above you or just below you in the sales charts. Then ask them, in front of the entire office, how it's going to feel to be eating your dust at the end of the month. It's what I like to call going public, and it's the biggest driver you can give to yourself. There should always be a bit of friendly banter in every sales office, and the top professionals love it. In fact, by doing this, you'll probably force them to raise their game too. But the important factor is what it does to you. By going public, you've made a commitment. And by making a commitment, you've added pressure on yourself to be number one for the month. This skill of generating your own competitive environment is crucial if you have any plans on being a top sales professional. 
Not only will it come in handy when you're trying to reach the top, but it will be a significant motivator for you when you get there. I used to ask myself what drives top athletes like Ryan Giggs, Tiger Woods, Michael Johnson and the others who've been winning time and time again to keep competing. How do they motivate themselves to keep winning when they've already demolished the competition? The truth is, they never stop competing and they excelled because they made themselves the competition. The real reason top athletes stay motivated is they are constantly trying to better themselves and reach the next level. If the performance drops, they see it as a defeat and strive to get back to peak performance. That is how a winner gets to the top and remains motivated to stay there for years and years. You are your best competitor. And by constantly evaluating and measuring your own performance, you can set standards to meet your personal best. So why not make those standards so high that nobody else can match you? Your call objective. I once coached a German gentleman who struggled to get any results despite his high activity levels. He wasn't sure what the problem was, but did say that he felt more like a customer service agent than a new business salesperson. We agreed to review a few of his calls and tried to isolate the calls. He was calling inbound leads who had requested a free trial of the company's software. And his opening line went a little something like this. Hey, I was just calling to check in and see if everything was okay with your trial and to ask if you needed any help or had any questions at all. This was obviously not the reason for his call. He merely said this to be polite and to try and build rapport. And people usually do this when they fear rejection. If your job is to make sales, the objective of your call is to qualify if your prospect has any needs for what you're offering and then get them to commit to the next steps, such as attend a follow-up meeting or call or sign a contract. Before you pick up the phone and speak to a prospect, you need to have a crystal clear picture of what you want to achieve by the end of the call. It takes just a couple of seconds and you'll probably be working with the same objective for most of your calls. In a book I once read, I heard a presentation expert say, to be able to start a presentation, you have to envision the ending. This advice also applies to your sales calls. You have to picture where you want your prospect to be by the end of your call or meeting. Depending on your role, your end objective might be closing the sale, booking a meeting or sending out an information pack. But your overall goal usually includes something else needed to achieve it. If you're cold calling, it should almost always be to qualify if the leader has any needs. Whereas if you're going to a final meeting, it might be to present your solution overcome any objections and close the sale. Of course, you don't want to call your prospect and tell them you'd like to qualify and close them, but you can always find an alternative way to say pretty much anything. For example, one of the account managers I used to coach came up with the following alternative. Hello, I'm calling as I noticed you downloaded our free trial and I wanted to ask a few questions to see if this is something you can benefit from or not. And if so, we can set up another call to discuss further. He then moved straight into the qualifying questions, which helped him get rid of the weak leads faster and prioritize the good ones. So, if your call openings make you sound like a customer service agent, or if you open your follow-up calls with lines like, I was just following up on our last call, or just checking in to see how things are going, you should take some time to write down some more powerful alternatives to ensure you reach your objectives more often. Gatekeepers. The most common problem salespeople have when cold calling is dealing with gatekeepers. Gatekeeper is a word used to describe a person who controls access to something. In sales, it's used to describe a receptionist, switchboard operator, or personal secretary because they control access to your contact person. Part of a gatekeeper's responsibility is to protect the time of the company's employees by filtering sales calls. When you dial the main switchboard number and ask to speak to your contact by their name or job title, you can expect to be interrogated by a gatekeeper. 
it's sometimes a little like getting through the border control officer to get into the United States. I had the pleasure of dealing with gatekeepers during my first business to business sales role in an extremely competitive telecommunications industry. My role was to book meetings for the regional business development managers and my days consisted of hardcore cold calling. So I became well acquainted with gatekeepers. They blocked my cold calls and follow-up calls, screened my emails, and did everything else in their power to stop me from doing my job and reaching my contact. It was a never-ending battle. After making more than 8,000 cold calls during my first three months, the gatekeepers started to get the better of me. A short time after, I quit my job, declared bankruptcy, and walked away from the sales profession altogether. Thankfully, I returned just a few months later, and the rest, as they say, is history. The gatekeepers were just as ruthless on my return, but my previous experience had helped me develop a tougher mental attitude. However, it was not until later in my career that I realized some of the biggest mistakes I made when dealing with the gatekeepers, and started coming up with a better strategy. Befriending the gatekeeper. The strategy of befriending the gatekeeper is nothing more than a reverse psychological trick designed to manipulate gatekeepers into doing something they should not do. When I first received training in the art of dealing with gatekeepers, there was a huge focus on the importance of befriending them. I still see many sales trainers recommending the same approach today. They'll tell you to be polite, get their name and tell them the compelling reason for why you're calling because people like to buy from people they like. But let me tell you a story about a guy named Johnny who was the master of befriending the gatekeepers. I started on the same day as Johnny at the telecommunications company I mentioned earlier. He was a charismatic and friendly chap of Greek descent with a strong Cockney accent and a classic suave Greek appearance. Johnny was well liked in the office and had previous industry experience. Hopes were very high for him. If there was one thing Johnny was brilliant at, it was building rapport with the gatekeepers. Without a word of a lie, he used to take them out on dates. He would woo them with his charm on the phone, take them out that same week, and really take the cold out of cold calling. Johnny was such a smooth talker. He knew the name of the gatekeeper at almost every company he called and would speak to them like they were his friends about all sorts of rubbish for a few minutes every time he called. I always remember feeling very envious, wishing I had the same ability. Despite his extreme ability to befriend the gatekeepers, it turned out that Johnny was booking more dates than meetings, leaving him consistently at the bottom of the sales charts, which eventually cost him his job. As awesome as Johnny was at building rapport with and befriending the gatekeepers, his efforts had been a complete waste of time. Most sales trainers who preach the befriending strategy fail to take into consideration quite a few crucial factors. In my experience, there are three types of gatekeepers. Number one, there are scarecrows. Number two, there are bouncers. And number three, there are parents. Scarecrows are typically switchboard operators who are merely there to direct your call. They may ask you one or two questions, but this is only to announce your call or log you in their system. You'll typically find scarecrows inside of larger organizations and with the right mindset, they will cause you no problems. Bouncers, frequently called receptionists, are semi-protective gatekeepers typically found in small to medium-sized businesses. Their role includes a variety of administrative tasks, including taking calls and messages for people. Some bouncers are easy to bypass, while others can be hardcore. I often find it depends on how competitive their industry is and on how well their day has gone. Friday afternoons tend to be an easy ride, whereas Monday mornings can be a nightmare. Parents I describe as the personal assistant or personal secretary. You'll typically deal with parents if you're trying to reach senior decision makers inside of large organizations. I would also describe the parents as the real gatekeepers and probably the only ones worth befriending. 
If you're not on good terms with them, or if you don't follow their procedures, you're going to find it hard to reach your desired contact person. A parent will often have a personal relationship with your contact person, so find out what calls your contact will take and what calls they won't. Some parents will also control your contact person's diary and know where they are every minute of every day. If you're calling larger organizations, it's likely you'll be dealing with scarecrows or parents. Whereas if you're calling small to medium sized businesses, you'll likely be spending most of your time dealing with bouncers. My recommendation is to avoid wasting your time befriending scarecrows and bouncers. They often have little or no influence with your contact person and, as Johnny found out, befriending them can have the opposite effect. His approachable nature enabled gatekeepers to take advantage of what he offered. They reversed the reverse psychology on him and made him feel bad about asking them to put him through to his desired contacts. And for that, he lost his job. Your gatekeeper mindset. These are not the droids you're looking for. If you're not familiar with that quote, it's spoken by Obi-Wan Kenobi a character in the 1977 movie Star Wars. He says it after being stopped by stormtroopers who are looking for the droids he is transporting. Obi-Wan uses his mind tricks to convince the stormtroopers they do not need to ask further questions about his droids so that he could move along. I recommend finding the clip on YouTube for the full effect. If you can apply the same strategy with gatekeepers when trying to reach your contacts, you'll be amazed by your hidden Jedi powers. The term gatekeeper is often so hyped up that you can easily find yourself locked in a constant battle with your own mindset. The worst thing you can do when calling out is always to expect the gatekeeper to try and block you. This assumption will put you in a negative frame of mind and will also come across in your communication. You'll either sound insecure, edgy, or a bit of both. A well-trained gatekeeper can sniff a vulnerable salesperson out in a heartbeat, and you'll be sending an email to the info ad address before you've had the chance to give your reason for your call. Even if you know the likelihood of getting through is small, you need to believe you should be put through and that your call is important. But most of all, you need to come across like you expect to be put through. It wasn't until later in my career that I realized I had developed a powerful unconscious strategy to bypass gatekeepers, which had been working flawlessly. The three question thank you technique. The three question thank you technique is my secret weapon for disarming gatekeepers. This technique alone, if mastered, will make your investment in this book worthwhile. After making thousands of cold calls, I began to get a little sick and tired of repeating myself, so I decided to investigate why. The first thing I noticed is that the gatekeeper often made me repeat everything I said when they answered the call. The conversation would typically start something like this, me, hello my name is David White and I'm calling from the company On Air Telecom, can I speak to Lee Lomas please? Gatekeeper, yes, can I ask who's calling please? Me, yes, my name is David White. Gatekeeper would then ask, and which company are you calling from? To which I responded, on air telecom. And the gatekeeper would then ask, and what is the call regarding? To which I would reply, it's regarding your mobile phone contracts. Final response of the gatekeeper would typically be, no thanks, we're not interested. Within 30 seconds, I had repeated my name, my company name, and quite often the name of my contact person. I realized I had delivered my information far too quickly, making it almost impossible for the gatekeeper to process it all at once. So I decided to try the strategy of giving it in a slower, smaller chunks. I figured that if I called and started by asking for the contact person I wanted to speak to, the questions about my name and company would naturally come afterwards. The results were instant. I no longer had to repeat myself on every call, and immediately I felt less frustrated. But this change in strategy also highlighted something even better. 
I had realised a strange sense of hesitance or a lack of confidence from the gatekeepers when I entered my calls in this new way. It was almost like they feared me a little. I was no longer trying to explain what my company did and I was getting put through to my contacts at a much higher rate. I realised that the gatekeepers seemed to have an unconscious psychological rule that asking two questions was okay, three were borderline nosy, and anything over that was close to being rude. And then I put two and two together. The gatekeeper's primary role is often to, to be the professional forefront of their company. They take calls from everyone, including customers, business partners, board directors, and many other people. So when I was calling without any introduction, and just asking for the name of the person I wanted to speak to, the gatekeeper had no clue if I was a salesperson or a member of the board. Hence, the hesitancy and lack of confidence I had noticed. There was also a couple of other subconscious elements to this new winning strategy too. Number one, I'm British, so I use my manners a lot. Saying good morning or good afternoon and using please and thank you are natural to me. I discovered these manners were having a magic effect with gatekeepers. The use of good morning or good afternoon at the beginning of the call ensured that I did not sound rude, especially considering I had stopped introducing myself by name right away. Saying thank you at the end of each response also acted as a psychological message that I now expected to be connected. And number two, I'm naturally confident and quite straight talking. And, as I already mentioned, confidence is critical in sales. By sounding a little authoritative when asking to speak to your contact person, you'll make yourself sound like someone of importance and increase the likelihood of being connected. Just be sure to remember your manners, because confidence can easily be mistaken for arrogance. So with this new approach, my cold calls were beginning to sound more like this. Me. Good morning. Can I speak to Lee Lomas, please? Thank you. Gatekeeper would respond, yes, can I ask who's calling, please? I would respond, yes, my name is David White. Thank you. Gatekeeper, and which company are you calling from? Me, on Air Telecom. Thank you. At this point, most gatekeepers will put you through, especially if they're just busy switchboard operators, aka scarecrows, who want to direct your call with speed so they can take the next call or carry on with their other tasks. With bouncers and parents, the conversation may continue to the defining question, and what is the call regarding? Here, you need to come up with a short and vague response. I found that if you come up with a technical or confusing answer, you get connected right away. So rather than saying my call was about their mobile phone contracts, I would just say, it's about the renewal of your subscription, thank you. Or, it's regarding a new batch of 5210s, thank you. Below is a list of examples of alternative responses for different types of businesses. Example A. The call is regarding your online marketing spend. Could be replaced by, it's regarding your CTR. Thank you. Example B. The call is regarding your website SEO. Could be replaced by, it's regarding your metadata. Thank you. Example C. The call is regarding recruitment services. Could be replaced by, it's regarding an employee matter. Thank you. Example D, the call is regarding website hosting, could be replaced by, it's regarding your VPS servers. Thank you. I recommend you put time aside to come up with a variety of potential responses based on your own business. You should then spend a day or two putting them to the test. Your toughest challenge when applying this new strategy will be breaking the habit of introducing yourself at the beginning of every call. You've most likely been doing this for a long time, so it's an unconscious habit. And the only way to truly break a habit is to replace it with a new one and practice it until it sticks. So with the combination of this three question thank you technique and your new Jedi mind powers, you are guaranteed to see a substantial difference in your connection rates, resulting in more conversations with your contacts and fewer headaches due to the gatekeepers. Truth or screen, how to detect gatekeeper lies. Regardless of how well my gatekeeper strategy works, 
you're still going to have to accept that you won't get through to your contacts every time. There will be times when your contacts are unavailable, on another call, in a meeting, away from the desk, or out at lunch. Based on my own experience of making more than 100,000 sales calls during my career, there's a 50-50 chance the gatekeeper will lie to you about the availability of your contact. I've witnessed plenty of comical moments where the gatekeeper has failed to adequately mute, mute their telephone while quietly asking the contact person if they wanted to take the call. It's infuriating when the gatekeeper says your prospect is out and you know the person is right there. But you must not let this get to you. Instead, have some fun with the gatekeeper and see how good you can get at lie detecting. I will reiterate to you though that your mindset is crucial when it comes to handling gatekeepers. If you believe they're lying to you every time, you'll frustrate yourself and make mistakes. Mistaking a lie with an honest answer is easy. The truthful reasons for your prospect's unavailability are usually the same reasons used by gatekeepers when lying to you. People are also very convincing liars when they do it often enough. I discovered the following signs that gave me a good indication of when a gatekeeper was lying to me. Number one, the gatekeeper would take all of your information and immediately confirm your contact is unavailable without checking. Number two, the gatekeeper will insist on taking a message multiple times, despite you having said you would call back. Number three, the gatekeeper will pause, say, erm, or clear their throat before answering. Number four, the gatekeeper will ask you to repeat your question and will still be slow to respond to it. And number five, the gatekeeper contradicts himself by telling you various reasons for the unavailability of your contact in any given day. Number six, the gatekeeper will try to connect you to your contact, but then come back and ask what the call is regarding. Now, all of these signs may indicate you've blown your cover and the gatekeeper knows it's a sales call. These signs are not bulletproof either, so don't jump to conclusions too. The most efficient way of detecting if the gatekeeper is lying to you is to master some immediate questions in response to their reasons for your contact's availability. So, if your gatekeeper tells you that your contact is unavailable and asks if you can call back later, you could respond by asking any of the following questions. Are they in a meeting? What time are they free again? Is there a better number to reach them on? Alternatively, if the gatekeeper tells you that your contact is in a meeting and constantly asks what the call is regarding, you could respond by saying, what time does the meeting end? Do you know what time the, what the meeting is about? Don't worry about it, I'll call back later. You may feel like some of the above questions are a little rude and intrusive, and indeed they can be. But if you can just adjust your tone of voice, select the right questions and use your manners, you can almost ask anything without it coming across in the wrong way. My personal favorite though, is always to ask if I can be transferred through to the contacts voicemail, especially if I get told they're on the phone. This one always catches the gatekeeper off guard if they're lying. What you should be listening out for is the gatekeeper's response to your questions. Some liars react angrily when challenged, while others will be more nervous and start to show some of the signs I mentioned earlier. I always recommend logging every call you make in your CRM, along with call notes, no matter how short. If your role includes making hundreds of cold calls and handling gatekeepers all day, you should be making a quick note to remind yourself of the reason for why you did not reach a contact, such as contact in a meeting, ask to call back tomorrow, anything else. This task may seem tedious, but it's smarter than calling the same company every day and listening to the same lie about your prospects on availability. Once it becomes apparent you're not going to get through a gatekeeper, then you have two options. Give in and move on, or get creative with ways to reach your contact. If you're working in a role where call volumes are high and deal sizes are small, I highly recommend moving on. It's easy to get stuck calling the same carousel of low quality leads if you don't learn how to let go. Alternatively, 
If you make less than 50 calls per day and work with bigger deal sizes, it's time to master some creative ways to bypass the gatekeepers. Seven ways to avoid gatekeepers. The strategy of calling the same company every day in the hope a tough gatekeeper will connect your call is like banging your head against a brick wall. If it's blatantly obvious you're dealing with a highly skilled gatekeeper, then change your approach. I've tried, tested and witnessed some crazy techniques for beating the gatekeeper during my time, but it's often the simple or creative ones that work best. Here I will share some of those with you. Number one, pay attention to detail. I'm often in disbelief at the lack of attention people pay to the resources and details available to them. A 30 second online search or a glance at the about us or contact us pages on your prospects website can sometimes give you access to the direct number of your desired contact person. And for heaven's sake, if you've been in an email dialogue with them, check their email signature for their direct contact details. Number two, call when the gatekeeper is not there. Most gatekeepers work a standard shift such as nine to five and take their lunch at the same time every day. You'll find that calling early in the morning, late in the afternoon, early in the evening, or during typical lunch hours can be the perfect time to avoid the gatekeeper. Number three, always ask for a direct number. If you've already had a brief conversation face to face or via telephone or email with your contact, don't forget to ask them what the best direct number is to reach them on. I also recommend asking gatekeepers for the direct numbers of your contact person too. Most salespeople are too afraid for fear of being cheeky, but you'll be surprised at how many times you get it if you ask. Number four, avoid sounding like a salesperson. I've already covered many of the basics such as not introducing yourself in full when calling and being short and vague about what your call is regarding, but you must also avoid other cliche sales habits too. Saying things such as like, hey, how are you doing today? When you enter the call is one that automatically triggers the suspicious, what are you after signal. Number five, try the wrong number or department. If you want to avoid the gatekeeper, don't call the main switchboard. When you can, locate the number of a specific department such as accounts or technical support. Next, call them apologize and say that you're sure you're not sure you've reached the right department then tell them who you're trying to reach it's a simple technique with a very high success ratio i would advise you though to avoid trying sales or customer service departments Salespeople know exactly what you're up to and customer service representatives are always likely to transfer you back to the switchboard number six leverage email and social selling I will deep dive into these topics later in the book, but creating a consistent strategy for emailing and messaging your contacts and following or tweeting them on various social media platforms is eventually going to get you engaged directly with your contact. Number seven, get referrals. Getting a personal referral from a mutual friend or acquaintance is the easiest route to direct contact. Search your network for anyone who works at the same company as your contact person or knows someone who does. Even if your buddy just knows the kitchen assistant, it's an excellent way to connect directly and avoid the gatekeeper. Consistent prospecting. One of the most common reasons skilled salespeople deliver average results is due to inconsistency in their prospecting strategy. It's all too easy to slack off on the cold calls when you've achieved your goals. But to achieve steady results, you must prospect consistently. To be an elite sales performer or a performer in any profession, you must keep working hard on the fundamentals. As I mentioned earlier, to get good at something, you must do it over and over again. I've seen so many new sales hires slog their guts out working night and day to achieve their sales goals and as soon as they do their prospecting work rate drops and they wonder why their sales results suffer the following month. I remember coaching a salesperson a few years back who was struggling with his performance. 
He'd been with the company for around about 12 months and it had taken him 10 months of blood, sweat and tears to reach his target for the first time. Yet, he found himself struggling to hit his numbers once again. I asked him what had changed recently, but he could not put his finger on anything specific. So, I asked him to go back to the period just before he reached his target for the first time and we found the aha moment. It turned out He'd made a change in his prospecting strategy during the month he hit his sales target and had automatically associated his success to this excellent new strategy, so had continued using it. As it turned out, his new strategy had nothing to do with his results. It was merely a coincidence that he had reached his target the same month he had started using it. His results had come from his hard work and consistency in the previous months. If you're working with sales cycles of 30 days or less, you'll see the results of your prospecting efforts 30 to 45 days from now. A month or even a week of lazy prospecting will always result in at least one below par month in your quarter. In my experience, most good salespeople can recover from one bad month in every quarter by putting in a little extra work. However, if you're working with longer sales cycles, a lack of consistency in your prospecting activity is risky business. It's hard to isolate the cause of low performance when you work in sales cycles of 60 days or more. It's hard enough to try and remember what activity you was doing last week, let alone last quarter. Worst of all, even if you're willing to change your behavior, you'll have to wait a long time before seeing any positive results. In today's fast-moving business world, few employers can afford to run the risk of more than six months of underperformance, so you may find yourself looking for a new job. Many busy sales leaders often put this inconsistency down to laziness. However, I believe it's more often than not due to a lack of motivation. Too many people work towards short-term goals without linking those goals to something bigger. This mindset will almost always result in a done that, what's next type of attitude once people eventually achieve those goals. Short-term goals result in short-term motivation. And if your short-term goals don't link in some way to your bigger, more important long-term goals, you'll find yourself always seeking new challenges and lacking motivation. Email outreach, voicemail, and social selling. On top of your activity levels, you must also create a consistent strategy for how you prospect, including a process for reaching out to your contacts using a variety of channels. The depth of your process will, of course, depend on how much time you can afford to allocate to each prospect. I'm often baffled at the lack of variation and creativity in the prospecting methods used by most salespeople. These methods are frequently one-dimensional and repetitive, such as only cold calling or spending 90% of the time sending emails or messaging via social media platforms. In today's modern age, if you want to reach people, you stand a much better chance of getting their attention when you diversify your prospecting activity. As a salesperson, you should see yourself as a branding tool. You need to put yourself out there. Now, I'm not saying you need to become a video superstar or create a weekly podcast, but you do need to overcome your fear of approaching people on multiple channels. You need to call your prospects, leave voicemails, send emails, follow them, connect with them, tweet them, retweet them, do whatever it takes so they remember your name. Please avoid the mistake of confusing persistence with consistency though. As much as I appreciate a tenacious attitude, it's important you do not become an annoying pest. Your prospects are busy people. They could be in the middle of any of a million things when you try to reach them. They may spend a lot of their time in meetings or traveling for business or working on projects that require complete focus. They will also have a personal preference for how you approach them. For example, I'm the worst person to try and cold call. I'm a busy entrepreneur with an endless list of things to do and talking to you is not one of them. I will need to see some potential value first. 
even if I did like taking cold calls, I am a hard man to catch, and my schedule is also inconsistent. Sometimes I'm consulting for a client on site for days, which in which case it would be highly unprofessional to take calls when my client is paying the bill. Other times, I spend blocks of hours building out presentations, writing content or recording videos, during which I remove all distractions, including my phone. My situations are probably not much different to your prospects, which is why you need to be patient and focus on consistency, variation and creativity to reach them. Prospecting via email. The benefit of email is that you can reach a lot of prospects in a short space of time without too much rejection. The drawback is that nobody responds. <laughs> okay, maybe that's not entirely accurate, but any email marketing company will tell you that the average click-through rate, or CTR as they call it, on emails is no higher than 2%. So it should not be your sole strategy for winning customers. I always used to send an email before calling my prospects. My objective was to provide a tiny snippet of what I could offer and see if I could extract a direct number and suitable time to call. It would sound something like this. Dear first name, I've recently helped known name decrease the drop off rate and increase order values on their website. And I wanted to investigate if I could help you do the same. What's the best time and number to reach you on for a quick call? Too many people write cold prospecting emails that pitch too much. They blabber on with a long-winded introduction to who they are and what they do, and then somewhere in the dense forest of words, they usually ask a closed question such as, do you have time for a quick call, or does this sound like something of interest? Your prospect only cares about what value they can get from your solution. If you don't get that message across in the first sentence, your email will be thrown in the junk mail with the rest. I highly recommend testing your emails. You need to measure which one performs the best in your sector. If you work with international markets, you should also pay close attention to which emails work best in each country. I've seen the most spammy looking emails get insanely high open and click rates in one country and get reported for spam in another. Your emails should also be saved as templates so you can send them at the click of a button. It pains me to see salespeople sit for 15 minutes composing long, dull emails for each prospect. It's nothing more than an enormous, unproductive waste of time. There are a lot of options these days for sending out emails. It can be a time saver to send them out in bulk, but I recommend chunking your campaigns into small batches. I didn't have any marketing support in my sales days, so I sent out all of my emails manually using templates. My goal was to ensure my email would potentially still be fresh in the prospect's inbox by the time I called them. So I would calculate how many cold calls I could make that week, line up my list, and send emails only to those prospects I could reach. It kept me pretty safe from getting put into any spam blacklists, and it also gave me a perfect opportunity to test my different templates. The only time I recommend sending mass emails is during the holidays. The amount of direct line and mobile numbers you can pick up from people's out of office replies is golden. Once I had sent my initial emails, I would start dialing. I would never mention on my calls that I had sent my prospect an email unless I was asked to submit one by the gatekeeper. I find that too many salespeople use irrelevant facts to try and build rapport with their prospects. Saying that you're calling to follow up on an email you sent is a poor way of opening a call. If I fail to connect with my contact person, I would always try to leave a voicemail followed instantly by one of my email templates. The subject line, missed call from David Craig White. The text, dear first name, I just tried reaching you via the telephone. What's the best time and number to catch you on? So by now, my prospect has received an initial outreach email and a voicemail, both communicating the same message. And they also now have my missed call email. Three seeds planted. Voicemail. In my experience, most people hate leaving voicemails and choose not to do so. 
The reason most salespeople hate leaving them is because they don't prepare for what to say and end up mumbling a lame pitch, which makes themselves cringe. The most common excuse salespeople use for not leaving voicemails is that nobody ever calls them back. But how can prospects call salespeople back if the prospects don't know how to reach them? If you're not leaving voicemails because nobody ever calls you back, you're missing the point. Voicemails are just another simple way of planting your name in the mind of your prospect. Your voicemail message needs three simple elements. Number one, a short introduction to yourself and your contact number. Number two, a message with a tiny snippet of the value you offer. Number three, repeat your short introduction and your contact number clearly. It might sound like this. Hello, this is a message for contact full name. My name is David Craig White from David Craig White International and my contact number is, state your number slowly and clearly. I've recently helped, no name, recruit seven new developers and reduce their recruitment costs and I wanted to investigate if I could help you do the same. If you could return my call or reply to my email with the best time and number to reach you on, it would be much appreciated. Once again, my name is David Craig White from David Craig White International and my contact number is, state your number again slowly and clearly, speak to you soon, thank you. I don't recommend leaving too many voicemails or emails in a short space of time. You need to create a consistent follow-up process that avoids annoying your prospects. The only time I would recommend persistent follow-up is when working with short sales cycles and dealing with inbound leads, who are usually well educated with your solution, so they tend to move a bit faster. It's also likely they're speaking with your competitors. When working with cold outbound leads, the frequency of your follow-up activities should be adapted to your sales cycles. If you're working with sales cycles of 30 days, contacting someone every day is too much, but every week may be too little. If your sales cycles are seven days, calling every day or two is probably adequate. I always try to work with the rule that no prospect with potential should be left completely untouched for more than 14 to 21 days. Even if you're just sharing your latest blog post or product updates with them, you need to stay fresh in their minds. Social selling. The term social selling is consistently misused and misunderstood by both sales and marketing professionals globally. Social media platforms should not be used to sell. The usage of social media platforms as a way of engaging prospects is not new. I was using LinkedIn more than 10 years ago to successfully reach new prospects. Social media is another great way of planting your brand in your prospect's path. By simply looking at the profile or connecting with them, it increases the chances they will look at your profile and thus look at what you do. The same applies when you follow them on the likes of Twitter or any other social media platform. You'll get much greater success in connecting with your prospects if you mix social selling with your email outreach, cold calls, voicemails and other prospecting channels such as events and webinars. When working with 30-day sales cycles and selling to marketing executives, my follow-up process used to look a little like this. On Monday, I would send out the cold call outreach. On Tuesday, I would make the first cold call, leave a voicemail and leave a missed call email if I couldn't get through to them. On the Friday, if I would not had a return call, I would try the cold call again and send another missed call email. The following Monday, maybe I will send a, uh, do another cold call and then do a social follow on one of the social networks. On Wednesday, I'll do another cold call and try a social media outreach, maybe a messaging or something. On the Friday, try another cold call and again send a missed call email. What I would do is simply rotate my activities to ensure I was hitting my prospect in as many different ways as possible. And I would also ensure I was mixing up which days and time of days I was trying them. It's not the smartest approach to keep trying people on the same days every week, but I see it consistently. The better you get at mixing your prospecting activities, the sooner you will start reaching people. Just remember to keep both your messaging and your frequency consistent across all platforms.